factors into reducing stress in leaders and within teams and, and cultures and environments? Mm. Uh, listen, I wish I could tell that I did a lot of work because that's certainly uh, my area of interest. Uh, but the truth is that my experience with corporate world is uh, is not great. It's because, uh, again, perhaps it's my personality. I cannot, as a scientist, uh, my business skills yeah. and ability to approach the business world uh, are not that great. And therefore, it's still a lot to learn for me uh, with that area. However, speaking to my friends who are, you know, CEOs and CFOs of, of big companies, I can tell how much, uh, how much emotional turmoil they go through yeah. and how much they could use that. And particularly that, obviously, those leaders have a massive influence on the employees, right? So they create the, they are responsible for creating the culture of the whole companies. And obviously they, uh, the bigger influence they have, uh, the bigger responsibility there is. So um, within, within that framework, I love what is being done by uh, Search Inside Yourself Institute uh, created by Google yeah. and and what they do about in the field of mindfulness, of mindful leadership. I think it's absolutely necessary to, to implement that and teach leaders about, about emotional regulation, about emotional intelligence, and how to be able to include this variety of emotions that they have to deal with, and not only within themselves, but uh, the emotions of, of people that they surrounded with. That's surrounded by. Mm -hmm. So yeah, indeed, I think it's a it's a it's a great topic. Um, however, again, I don't have much at this stage uh, personal experiences to share with, except of those of my of my friends yeah. uh, and my circles. Do you think, Tomic, that that's a little bit? I, I I agree. The silly search inside yourself, you know, um, platforms great, but I, I, I'm with you a little bit in terms. Of, I think the leadership and mindfulness as a, as a performance tool um, in Australia, especially where I always feel like wellness in Australia, we're about five, sometimes maybe 10 years behind the U S or the bigger companies mm. that are really evolving for us. We've got to play catch up or we've got to see that it's, it's, it's worthy to come to Australia and for leaders to then embrace it as, as normal. Um, so yeah. I've, I've noticed that with, with a lot of the wellness stuff, I've built a wellness program for the cotton on group. Um, and we were lucky that we were quite advanced and ours is comparable to sort of any of the, the health and wellbeing programs, you know, globally, but most companies, even just with health and wellbeing programs, you know, either get their wellness program and put it in with HR or they put it in mm -hmm. with um, health and safety. Very few have a standalone health and wellbeing department or program that that's its own program that connects to performance and works with, you know, teams. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, um, I, I checked a couple of uh, job offers uh, and the wellness program comes with HR and usually has to do with people that uh, undergone a, a serious accident or, 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 or trauma. And wellness is being perceived as a remediation of, of that unfortunate event. And and the things like uh, and that's obviously it's post factum, right? But something already happened. We have to respond to it in a certain way. That's what they call wellness. But and the part where where they actually train people to to prevent those situations to happen, uh, the, the the emotional distress and and that emotional turmoil is it's a very small part because it's still. And again, I'm not an expert in this field. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to say much about it. But at least to me personally, seems that because there's no immediate benefit in a monetary sense in teaching people mindfulness uh, in various forms. Again, it's not just sitting on a cushion, no. but ways to deal with emotions. It's not even mindfulness, but I would call it emotional regulation and emotional intelligence, right? Yeah. They can't see the immediate benefit of it. And if there's no immediate benefit of it, 
then then perhaps we can postpone it versus you know you have a situation when a person at work uh has an accident that's something we have to deal with immediately otherwise there, there's a lawsuit coming with it that may cost us millions of dollars yeah uh, so yeah. so it may to to me it 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 has to do a bit with how about long term looking at at the wellness of the company not just not just reactive yeah but proactive yeah and i tommy we're pres- predominantly in australia and around mindfulness and, and wellness within that we're prescriptive like well right if there's a problem what's the prescription so how do we fix it if, mm. if there's a problem with mm. sick leave or stress we need to fix the problem as opposed to being preventative in terms of okay it's not there yet, but we can see it's on the horizon. So we want to, before it gets to a prescription need, what's the prevention? What's going to be the one that's going to sustain our wellness and also improve mm. performance? And we want to get ahead of the curve. And, and companies and leaders, as a, as a general rule, are not thinking that way about the wellness and the, and the mindfulness of their people. Mm. And I think you you actually hit the nail on the head by saying that leaders are not aware of this. Because, well, because they're not aware. Yeah. And if you if you don't have that perspective, if you don't have awareness of it, even if the solution is there, you won't be able to perceive it. Right. We're coming back to the very beginning of our conversation, where we essentially yeah. described awareness as a glue that holds it all together. Oh, and yeah, and yeah. obviously awareness of awareness of the leaders of this kind of situation, it's absolutely crucial. And it doesn't come from the leaders. And that's why I think uh, mindful leadership is so important. Because if it's not going to come from there, uh, basically, it's going to it's going to be stifled at, at that at that stage. And it's going to be only prevent it's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to serve the purpose of prevention, but only reaction and and, and solving the problem, existing problems. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, and it's it's the it's the way we can articulate and talk to to mindfulness and how we can normalize meditation and normalize um, starting a meeting and then just asking if everyone's okay, um, potentially having a pause within a meeting to make sure everyone can get clarity and, and have that space to think and. And that for that to be just become normal, not not out of the box or not silly or, or not soft, but as but seen as this is a really great way to do business. That's mm. that's the bit that I'm like you working with 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 groups. Is, yeah. it, is, it doesn't become extra and add on. It becomes built into the way we operate as as people. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, obviously, that's the goal. And um, that would be wonderful to see. However, uh, what I'm encountering is even if people recognize uh, recognize the usefulness of a uh, form of cognitive fitness, mindfulness, meditation, and, and yoga, um, I think it happens on the superficial level. So they may smile and they recognize, sure, let's sit in silence for one minute, but because there's no awareness of what's behind it and why you actually do it, it washes off very quickly. And, and basically that information doesn't stick. Mm. And I think that's where practice, it's fundamental, right? Because during those periods of, uh, of, of mindfulness, daily mindfulness, you, you understand, you, get, you start having first-hand experience of those moments where this is not just a concept of, oh yeah, I just sit in silence for one minute because someone told me it's good for me, yeah, yeah. but you actually experience it. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I was pondering upon uh, even this morning was how can you change a belief system of a society or of an individual? Mm. And the conclusion I came to, which is not a new one, is you cannot possibly do it by telling someone that this or that is true that can only happen on the individual level by having the person experience and and i think rob monroe has this wonderful saying uh that believes one believes are not necessary once you have 
personal experience. So the beliefs with capital B are converted or transformed into knowns with capital K. And then the belief is no longer necessary. Mm. You know, if I, I always give that example, you know, I can tell you that vanilla ice cream, it, it, I tried a French vanilla ice cream, tastes this way and has this texture. And, and you might believe me that this is absolutely amazing experience. But that doesn't matter because the moment you try it, you actually get to the bottom of it, so to speak. And I think the same with leaders, right? They, they obviously, they were trained. They went to maybe a training where they, were, where they were told that mindfulness, emotional regulation, and emotional intelligence are important for the well-being of, of their own and the companies, right? But if, again, and that's something that I already mentioned, if you don't practice it yourself, if you don't have a first, first experience, of it by yourself. This is all this these always will be just empty words and words, right? And words do not transform people, experiences do. Yeah. Yeah, I I do agree with that Tomic and I'll, I'll throw in one more thing which I think can sort of sway it is the environment in which society's positioned ourselves and you know that the leader has the experience potentially and of mindfulness and believes in it but then if the environment's not inviting of it and appreciative of it. The fear of the leader looking out of the ordinary or, or looking you know, like, like he doesn't fit in can also stymie that, that, that progress for that person because the boss doesn't do it and doesn't believe in it or, or whatever, or the culture isn't supportive. And that can also, the environment has a huge influence on, on how we think and act. And I, th I, I believe that's, the challenge we've got in society is the environment's not inviting because in some ways it wants us to stay unaware and unconscious because that's where the money's to be made in terms of mm. buying stuff that you don't need and, you know, eating food that it's not good for you. That happens predominantly at an unconscious level. And that's, that's where the money mm. is. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very true. And, and what you call uh, environment uh, in my head I call a collective consciousness. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yep. And and we, you know, doesn't matter how hard you try, there's a collective consciousness. It's it's a powerful it's a powerful source of of emotional states and of and, and therefore behaviors. And again, uh, an example uh, example that comes to mind is many people complain that they work in a toxic environment. Mm. Right. What it really means that they, the majority of people or the collective consciousness of the company, of the people that created, is it's actually it's a collective unconsciousness, so to speak. So many things are hidden from them, and therefore they no, they don't know why, but they feel horrible. That's why they call it a toxic environment. Right. Yeah. And I think that's what we try to that's what we try to do. We try to bring light to that unconsciousness and bring it to the surface because once you bring it to the surface even any person can actually make the right choice but the problem is if you are not aware of it if if the consciousness is not there how can you recognize it yeah right how can you avoid it how can you make the right choice so so indeed um the collective environment or collective consciousness it's an important thing and and I think that's something that and mass is very difficult to change. You can first of all because it's huge, the scale of it is massive. And the the fact that you mentioned that we it seems like Australia it's ten years behind uh things that happen in the US, that might be, you know, the thing. Uh, because uh, all the spiritual teachers from India, they well many of them at least, uh moved to the US. And even on the inside timer, when you look at it how many meditators are there from the US versus how many meditators are in other parts of the world. It's, you, you can see, you can see quantitatively how it looks like. Oh, it's um, crazy. It's crazy yeah. when you look at that. I've looked at that stat too and, and sort of, it's, yeah, there's, there's an awareness. Obviously, there's more people, but there's a huge, there's a much greater yeah. awareness in the US um, for the need for mindfulness and, and for meditation. Um, can you talk a little bit about, Tommy, your insight timer and sort of what you've got there. You've got a really great following at insight timer, which I actually think, and I'll suggest to anyone that's listening 
on the podcast. If you're looking to learn to meditate, you want education that's really cheap on 